Hello, everyone. I'm here with Ian Howard as part of our founder success stories with startups.com, community-based founder accelerator. And Ian is the co-founder of ShowerStream. And ShowerStream so far has raised two and a half million dollars to make showers for hotels smarter and save the world at the same time, environmentally speaking. And we're going to be talking about his journey, and also what you can also do if you're a founder, especially if you're in the hardware space, or we're going to be talking about being a founder right out of college or through college as part of the college experience. I'm excited to have this conversation because I've been, I've had the pleasure of advising Ian for the past little bit, and this is going to be good. I'm totally excited. Ian, thanks for uh, joining us. Well, thanks for having me, Ed. I I, I do appreciate uh, you know talking about the my experience and any way I can help future founders. It, it is one of the things I really uh, love doing and love about being a founder. Uh, so yeah, happy to happy to be here. Thanks. All right. So let's talk about your background. So just give us a thumbnail shot of your background, really quick, and then how you got to the point of being a founder. Sure. So, um, so I graduated um, from the University of Texas at Austin with a bachelor's in mechanical engineering. And while I was getting my bachelor's, I um, did an internship at a, a big aviation company called Textron Aviation. Um, hated it. Uh, thought it was incredibly boring. Um, and from that point, you know, my trajectory changed from looking for a big corporate job to okay, what, what are some other options? And I found uh, a great startup program in the university, which is actually, I studied abroad in, in Chile, in Santiago, and did like this whole program where I started a company in a class, like it was a semester long class, just focused on starting a company. Did it, the company failed, but I, I was, you know, I loved it from that point on. And then went on to uh, uh, found ShowerStream. I think that the semester after that, which was my last semester in college and then continued on full time after I graduated. So I was really bitten by the bug, you know, at that point. And then, um, and then to start, you know, to start shower stream, we initially got funded by uh, in a couple in like, I think one or two angel investors, not much money, like 20 K um, we want it through pitch competitions um, and then the first big funding was uh, a grant, National Science Foundation, SBIR grant. And that was sort of the big break, which happened right as I graduated, which was very convenient because that allowed me to pay myself and a few other people to work on it full time. Um, so that, yeah, that's, that's how it started. All right. Lots to unpack there. Let's yep. just break it down in a bite-sized chunks. You're in college, you do an internship, boring, right? So you're thinking to yeah. yourself, ah, this career trajectory of just going and getting a job, not for me. You poke around yeah. the college you're at. Now I can tell you actually did, did study in Chile because you pronounce it Chile versus Chile, which is great. <laughs> so yeah. that, that experience served you well. Then you find out about startups, you try one doesn't go well, then it comes on the shower stream. Obviously, your domain expertise is being a mechanical engineer. Let's talk about for a moment shower stream, and then we'll get into some other principles that can help other founders. 350 billion gallons of water plus 48 billion kilowatt hours. That's how that's it, right? Yeah, kilowatt hours of yep. energy um, equals $50 billion waste every every year. How did you decide on tackling this problem? Like walk through, did you try a whole bunch or was this something on your mind the whole time? Like, how did you get here? Yeah, I definitely didn't start with this problem uh, at all, really. Like initially it was like um, just a conversation. Oh, you know, we were thinking about startup ideas um, and it was just uh, like basically a conversation. And one of the ideas was like, okay, let's, how about a shower? that you can um, 
like that has an app and you can just turn on your shower like from your bed in the morning or something so the shower comes on and like so by the by the time you get out of bed and you hop in the shower the shower is already warm so you don't have to like wait for it at all okay and so basically we built that and um then we started doing customer it was, it was like a classic thing where like you, you build a solution that before the problem before you know if the problem exists so okay that's not, the problem didn't really exist we soon found out <laughs> like we, we built the solution and then we figured okay well no one's actually really wants to buy this or wants to pay any uh sustainable amount of money for this so but we already had sort of a very early ugly prototype and so we were thinking so we, we were researching like problem as we were re researching that problem we found a few studies on shower warm-up waste um mainly out of berkeley national labs the studies were um and the shower warm-up waste is basically the water that's wasted when you know, the shower water is hot, but the bather hasn't entered the shower yet. That's this right here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And okay. so the, the, these bullet points are mostly from from uh, this Berkeley National Lab study. And so when we stumbled upon the study, we were like, okay, this is, this seems like a legitimate problem. Um, mainly, you know, for the water, the energy, but really the money, uh, which is about $100 per year. Uh, on the next slide, you can see that. Uh, a little more about the, the, the yeah, hundred dollars per year per shower. And so this plot is also from the study just shows that, you know, on average people waste about two minutes or 20% of every shower after the water has already gotten hot. It takes them, you know, two, two minutes to get in usually. So we found this problem and then we, we learned our lesson from starting from the solution. And instead of building a solution for it, we, uh, went out and interviewed hundreds of customers, like hundreds, um, from all different, all different verticals. So anyone that owned a shower, basically, we we interviewed from obviously homeowners, like consumers, sure. um, apartment um, owners, uh, dormitories, um, uh, cruise ships, uh, gyms. You know, literally anyone that owned a shower. Hotels, of course, and. Uh, what we found is that the pain point for this was obviously most uh, in uh, biggest in hotels. And um, so after doing all of these interviews, we sort of uh, narrowed and refined the problem to a hotel to ho four hotels. And, and, you know, hotels we thought were the most valuable customer because one hotel owner owns hundreds of showers um, and uh, at a franchise level, they own, you know, tens of thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands of showers. So it's like um, rather than going like door to door sales, uh, selling like B2C, we could take advantage of the, the scale there. And like one set, one sale would be a lot of money for us. And, and they're also highly extra incentivized to save money. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And also like a hundred dollars per year is not a lot of money for like a average homeowner or something, but for a hotel that has 300 uh, rooms, you know, that's 30,000 a year. And that's a significant uh, savings for um, most hotels, especially economy hotels, which is sort of the sub market sub market we're initially focused on uh, within hotels. So, you know, there, there are more reasons, but yeah, really, we just found the biggest pain point was in hotels from doing these hundreds and hundreds of customer interviews. And it wasn't until we had that is when we actually built our first prototype to solve that problem, which was incredibly ugly. But, you know, we, we waited at least. <laughs> yeah. yeah. OK, let's go back to I love that you brought this up. You know, the number one problem that shuts startups down is they run out of money. Right. And that could be for a whole bunch of reasons. They can't raise, they can't sell, et cetera. The second reason, which I think is the largest contributor to first reason, is nobody needs the product. No, it doesn't solve a pain, what have you. So you described it as you create the solution and you're looking for a problem. So instead of problem solution fit, you build something solution problem fit. So I got this great idea. 
but turns out nobody really needs it or wants it. This is very common. Let me ask you a question. In your experience with other founders, because you network and you're part of our community, how often do you see hardware or other startup founders start with the solution and they're not really solving a problem that's viable or represents a good market, is a good problem to solve, a worthy problem to solve for a startup? How often do you see this? Uh, pretty often, you know, like, I spe- like less so obviously in the, in the later stage startups, like startups that have raised VC funding, it's, le- it's much less common, but, um, you know, it, it's, it's very common for startups, especially early stage. Cause it's just like, it's like the, I guess it's like the natural intuition for humans just to like build stuff, build something. And it's, ex- it, it's, it's incredibly dangerous in, in uh, hardware specifically, because if you build something in software um, that, you know, if you're, if you're building a solution before you have the problem figured out in software, it's not always a big deal because you can build something quick, cheap, simple, and then iterate super fast on it. But you just can't really do that in hardware most of the time. So you'll end up spending a lot of your time and money even sometimes patenting, you know, something that like you just don't have the, have the product market fit yet. And then, you know, you're down a hole and it's like, it's, yeah, it's like you said, it's like, it's death to a lot of startups, especially hardware. And you went through a process of idea validation as well as customer discovery. So what I love about this is you went out, you just generally talked to everybody. How does this pain point work? And Then you narrowed it down. You went customer discovery and you segmented the people you talked to. And you said, this really works because I found that, you know, right off the the bat um, and I'll put this up again saying this is so important and kudos to you because a lot of times right on the cover of their deck, they're going to put some marketing slogan some tagline or what have you, you just flat out say, these are smarter showers for hotels, not even sh- uh, smarter showers that save, save money. You actually included your segment in here and it was very smart for you to do so. How much has that helped? Talk about the benefits of then you narrowing in down in terms of fundraising, talking to people, What's been the benefit of you doing that idea validation and that customer discovery so other founders can hear, if I just take the time to do it, I'll make my life easier. How's it been yeah. for you? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a necessity, in my opinion. You, you have to narrow, like, you, you have to both be incredibly specific, but also pitch a large vision at the same time to really convince people that you're working on the right thing and to raise money because you have to both show that you recognize how small uh how like how many hours there are in in a day and how many you can get done with a team of like two or three co-founders so you have to be very specific like you can't say yeah we're gonna take on this whole market at the same time we're gonna go these different these five different directions it's like no one's ever gonna believe that you can do that as like, okay, yeah, when you're a series A, series B company, it's different. But when you're so early, like you have to be incredibly specific on what you're going to do and which customers are you're going to go after because you can't go after them all. And um, yeah, so I think, you know, spec- specifying, narrowing down is incredibly important. And I think that, yeah, the only way to truly or successfully do that um, is to, just yeah, search search for a problem as uh, as 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 much as you can. And what you know, like I said, I we started out with a solution like originally because we knew nothing. We really knew nothing about entrepreneurship, and so we just built something and then like okay. But then initially, I was obsessed with like learning about entrepreneurship. So like I read a lot of Steve Blank's work, mm-hmm. and he, I mean, he lays it out. Uh, like what you should like how you how to search for a problem how to basically start from ground zero and then after so I credit a lot of like the success on the on the second round of finding the problem uh, solution fit uh, to his, him and his books 
um, which the, the titles of which I'm not sure off the top of my head, but mm-hmm. like, I think he has two books and um, two very popular books and, and I read them both and they're super helpful um, with doing that. I mean, yeah, it's vital reading for any, any new entrepreneur. Which is a common challenge that founders find themselves in. They may have a technical skill and they're ready to go out and try something, but there's so many other factors of being an entrepreneur. Being a founder is different. Steve Blank is great because he really does break down the types of founders and the pathways that they have. I want to give credit to your co-founders. You did mention co-founders. How did you meet your co-founders? What was the process in getting them together and say, hey, let's do this startup together. I love the fact that you've got a pretty diverse team as far as co-founders are concerned. What happened there? Yeah, so actually I, um, I met Greg. So Greg and I um, are both UT grads, but he, he graduated a bit earlier than I did. Um, and I actually met him during my uh, senior or my, my last semester in college. My, you know, mechanical engineering students at UT, they do a capstone like engineering product project where they work for a company. And so Greg already had like, it was very, very early like ideation stage. Um, and it was just him, but he, he wanted to, he, he had recently quit his job and was, you know, wanted to start a startup, but he didn't really have an idea. It was, it was very early. And he, he, he chose to like, uh, do like partner with UT or do the partner with a team of UT students basically to search for co-founders mainly. Um, like he wanted someone to, to sort of come on board and that he thought that might, it might be a good way to do it. And yeah, I mean, there were, there were like four of us working on it. I was the team lead and I was already so interested in entrepreneurship. And I just, I, you know, basically fell in love with, with the, not, not the idea really, but just like the, the startup, the, the mindset, um, and we just together we came up with like uh, like well I told, kind of told the story but we came up with the, the idea for shower stream and found the problem solution fit and uh, or we think we did and and yeah that's sort of how we met and then um, <clears throat> Priya uh, actually joined a bit later so through our NSF we get a there's like an additional program you can apply for where you the um, they'll sponsor a postdoctoral researcher. Um, they'll basically pay the salary and stuff of a postdoctoral researcher to work for your company. And so we got that program and Priya has been um, the one, like the postdoctoral researcher we worked with going on two years now. Um, and it's been, yeah, it's been amazing. She's, she's super great and uh, we hope to keep her forever. Yeah, awesome. Well, then you build a prototype. Obviously, this isn't the first prototype that you built. Yeah. You no. build a prototype and you, you go through your iterations and then you go and you start gathering data. Walk us through the prototyping process. I'm particularly interested in when you started showing other people when you started raising was it at the prototype stage as soon as it's built after you gather data like what was the process do that including the fundraising well we so we were always fundraising for like the first two years of the company the focus really was not on the product i mean we still worked on the product a lot but the focus was much more on the business like from fundraising, customer, yeah, really fundraising, customer development. Um, those were really the focuses. So like when we first received our first investment, the prototype was incredibly ugly, but it, we did have a prototype and it kind of worked, <laughs> kind of, not, not great, definitely not great. But, you know, if you, if you try, if you, if you work hard enough, like even if you have a prototype, that's not great. Like you can, it's more about the concept and like pitching a vision. If you don't have, like, if you don't um, at the early, early stages, 
as long as you have a, a vision and, 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 uh, and customers that are willing to uh, pay for your, um, for your product, even if you don't have the product ready yet, uh, it, it's, it's good enough. You don't need the, the perfect solution. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, we, we just had like a very basic prototype that like worked some, some of the time and, uh, we were able to close a couple, like 10, 20,000 of angel funding with that. And then also we were able to get the, you know, $225,000 NSF grant at that point too. And so it was very early prototype really didn't work at all. Um, but the pitch was very good. I mean, let's, the pitch was very good. Let's back this up then. It's important. You, your pitch was good because you clearly understood the problem solution. You could articulate it. Then investors want to see founders that can build something. Like that's a yeah. huge de-risk, de-risking component. The founders yeah. say, we've got this idea and could be as eloquent as possible, but at least you built something even though it didn't work all the time, you proved you could build something that works in your favor. And you're pitching the whole way through, how did you meet these angels that come, came on board? Like what happened there for you to actually get to the network of people who could write those checks? Uh, yeah, so we, we had something and still do, and still do this now, um, which we call like an opportunity pipeline. And it's just like, looking, uh, searching anywhere and everywhere for events, uh, pitch, pitch events, like competitions, um, you know, a, uh, investor networking events. And so how do you find those? Well, in Austin, where we're based, um, there's a pretty good network of, uh, various groups. Uh, you know, there's, there's events like capital factory is a big one, which is in Austin and, you know, they host events that you can just go to for free or whatever. And you can network with different people. And like, basically eventually once you build up a big enough network, uh, you know, you'll, you'll start hearing about different events happening and, and you'll, fi- you'll figure out where to look for the, um, you know, incubators, accelerators, uh, pitch competitions, anything like that. And, you know, in the early days, that's literally all we did after building a prototype, early prototype, which took about six weeks. So not very long after we had that, we li- we were like hands off. All we did was pitch competitions and looking to raise money because we, we recognized that there's no way we're going to build this without some funding. And, um, so yeah, really it was just, uh, you know, I mean, spending like almost every waking second, just, just, uh, improving the pitch, um, and, and like all the accessories. So like building a minimal website, um, everything you like would need just to make yourself look good, you know, to, to investors really was our, our, our number one focus. And so we, we got, uh, we won some pitch competitions, um, after a while, you know, not, not at first, like it took, we lost many, many competitions before we won a single one, but we nice. did end up winning a few. Okay. We got into an accelerator called Mass Challenge. Um, and then, you know, it sort of snowballs from there. Like once you, once you start winning, once you start, once your pitch gets good enough, like it, it can sort of snowball. And then we, we, we actually applied for the National Science Foundation grant three times. And you wow. have to wait six months in between no way. applications. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, so we got it on the third time and, and by the third time we were really good at grant writing and we still are pretty, pretty darn good. I'd say at grant writing. So, um, yeah, so just, you know, it just takes, it's just a lot of work, a lot of practice, a lot of like obsession on just the business, the, your, your business, you know, you bring up an excellent point because founders, what they'll do is they'll be obsessed with product development and not yeah. distribution and they'll forego yeah. distribution networking and because they're building their product and then when they need to raise money they don't know where to go they don't have any contacts your team made the conscious decision to say we are stopping product and we are going all in because we have to go network and what have you and that really is the secret to to do these cycles and and we, we tell founders, do it 50-50. You should be doing 
50% product development and then 50% distribution or networking, et cetera. And many founders come back and they say, but you know, the product's not going to be there. You are okay with having a crappy MVP and pitching yeah. that and going out there. And that served you really well to get those checks, build that momentum and 18 months <laughs> to wait for a grant to come through. That's some serious resilience. What advice would you give other founders that are in this slug fest, this slosh, this grind? Because I talk to them all the time and they're, they're depressed. I, I applied for this grant and I'm sitting around, my capital is dwindling. What advice would you give to founders like that? I mean, <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, we were also depressed in that same situation. You know, I don't know if you cannot be depressed. I mean, I guess you could, but it, it's just a tough situation. Like for anyone mm -hmm. in that situation where, where you're just like, you're not paying yourself. Uh, you're, it's been a long time. Like you're, you're doing it all like a uh, part of it uh, for, in my opinion, like is what that is what drives can drive people to do incredible things when you're just that desperate. Wow. And it can also drive people to quit, you know, and that that is what it is. But like, you know, uh, I think um, <laughs> the best advice I have is to not give up, which is, <laughs> you know, not, not sure that's great. I mean, it's advice, but um that's all you can really do. I mean, you, you just, I think you just have to focus on the right things. Like the reason we stopped product development is because we had to, I mean, we, we just had no choice. Like we, we, we didn't have, you know, we didn't have much funding. Like we, we didn't, we were running very low on time, like personal bandwidth, uh, personal runway. Um, so really the only option, it was like, literally we're going to raise money. Or, or we're going to quit. And so we just paused everything except for that one thing. And we got really, really good at that one thing because that's literally all we did. And we were obsessed with it. And then it eventually worked out, but you know, it easily could not have, but I think it definitely wouldn't have if we were splitting our focus or like, we're not as obsessed with it. And you stuck to it. Not only did you say, don't give up, but we're going to keep honing our skills. I talked to founders and for people who are going to be, you know, watching this founders, I've talked to founders and given them a list of 130 investors that are right in their industry, right in their vertical, can write the exact check. And I contact them months later and they, and they go, no, the fundraising didn't work. And I ask them, well, how many investors did you contact? 12. And, yeah. you know, and they've got other things going on and they were deterred by the first initial no's. Yep. You are an example of don't be deterred by that. Just keep going because then I tell the founder, listen, you should be doing nothing. If you're in that situation, many of the founders are running out of that money, which is that number one reason. And I say, you should be doing nothing but be, you know, stay on the phones all day long until you get to that list, until you know, if you had given up, your team had given up right at the beginning of the first pitch competition, say, oh, we're not built, you know, we're not built for this. Think about where you wouldn't be right now. And so don't give up, keep, focused on it that's what your team did i'm curious how did you support each other like you're in these dark moments these f founders and i've been in a situation where you're all in it is you are on the edge of catastrophic failure or fear i'm gonna have to go get a job or you know what have you i don't want to do this all my dreams how did you all three of you support each other how did you take care of like your mental health like what was the self-care regime did you talk to family did you get therapy what happened <laughs> um i don't uh yeah i think we just kind of brute forced it to be honest i don't okay. like there wasn't much strategy in terms of like taking care of ourselves honestly which i i think it, it worked because of just the personality types that that we were that greg and i were and it was just like we were uh extremely hard-headed um uh, like, um, just 
you know, like once you start something, you want to, we want to finish it. Like just that type of mindset, like at, at, that's still true today uh, to a fault in some points, for sure. It's like, it's like an obsessive personality and those can, uh, types of personalities can be bad in a lot of situations, but it, you know, it worked, it worked out for us. But um, yeah, I mean, no, we were just like, I think it, it I mean, you, you, um, your team has to like um, show that everyone is completely committed uh, because if like, if, if one person isn't committed or something, it really, uh, can hold back everyone else because it's like, okay, well, if they're not gonna stay up all night and be here with me, then like, why am I, why am I doing it? Like, I don't, it's not, it's not worth it. So it really, it truly needs to be like everyone you're working with has to be on that same level. And, you know, we went through a lot of co-founders in the early days because it's just like, a lot of people like weren't weren't willing to do that or various things but like it all boiled down to like just like commitment and um like willingness to like go the extra mile sort of thing so yeah i did not know that that you went through co-founders it's a very astute yeah. lesson to learn on how we get there let's talk about your first customers so you're doing some pretty cool pilots right now we've been talking about it ongoing how did you go out and find these initial customers? What's your go-to-market strategy in that sense? All right, so we have a we're taking a top-down approach to the hotel market. Um, so we uh, our, our our ideal customers are hotel franchises or large ho hotel management groups. Which the hotel market is actually very confusing and complicated um, in the sense of like, there's a lot of different people, like there's certain groups that manage hotels, but don't own them. There's certain groups that franchise hotels, but don't manage them, blah, blah, blah. So without going into that, um, essentially we're, we're, we, we want to partner with big decision makers who own, you know, hundreds or thousands of properties in the U S. And so, you know, mo most of those, a lot of them are, are companies people know, like Motel 6, Hyatt, um, Hilton, et cetera. And so we have basically two main customers right now. Uh, Motel or G6 Hospitality, which is the like the parent company of G6, uh, Motel 6 and, um, and Hyatt. And so we got introductions to the CEO of uh, Motel 6 through our connections at Blackstone, uh, you know, big private equity company. Um, Blackstone owns the brand Motel 6, among other large hotel brands. Um, I actually, we got introduced to Blackstone through a pitch competition uh, years ago um, before we raised our seed round. Um, it was like a student pitch competition, okay. uh, Techstars Launchpad. Um, and um, yeah, so we won that. Uh, flew to New York, you know, met the Steve Schwartzman, CEO of Blackstone. Nice. He, yeah, it was pretty, pretty amazing. <laughs> it was like in, you know, 32nd floor in the, like downtown uh, New York. We ate lunch with him and he was served soup by his butler, which was pretty interesting. So he was just like eating soup while we were all talking. Pretty funny. But um, yeah, anyway, he, he introduced us to the head of real estate there, had a, like a 30 minute, one hour meeting, uh, just gave him the pitch. And then he was like, yeah, I have someone who, who you can talk to and we can get a pilot launched and he introduced us to his employee which was the ceo of g6 hospitality uh, rob Pileschi. and then so we then met with rob he was like yeah this is great let's do a pilot pass this on to the director and we did a pilot and then we've been working with the director uh that he entered us like since then. And he's still today is our, is our main uh, contact and sort of our true leader at within G6. Um, but yeah, that's how we got that. And then Hyatt was a similar thing. We got an intro to the CEO of Hyatt through one of our in, uh, seed investors. So it was a little later. Um, and then met with CEO of Hyatt in, in Chicago where their HQ is. And uh, same thing, like we just converted it in the meeting. He said, yeah, this is great. Handed, out, handed us off to uh, a few of his um, VPs to work with. And we're still working with them now. Uh, yeah, today. So it's, it was sort of similarly worked in both ways. 
and that that's our plan going forward. We we have a good network now of people who have uh, connections to these large hotel groups, and we're sort of just now uh, working on our product before taking on more customers. Sure. Uh, but we yeah we ha we have that sort of ready in the pipeline. And we're just you know paused on it for now until the time is right. That's another example of this two pronged strategy: development, distribution, development, distribution. Yep. You're working those angles. I hear you're networking, and then you're refining your pitch. So you're helping your network introduce you because your pitch is good. Walk me through, you've got some heavy hitters working with you. How many advisors, board members, like what's the configuration that you set up for your company? Yeah, so we have three, like three board seats um, and it's just Greg and I, uh, so the two co-founders and then Nick Moran is the third one. He was, uh, he's the uh, founder of Newstack Ventures, which is the venture uh, firm that the VC that led our seed round. And so he also has a board seat. Um, but then, as for, yeah, for our advisors, um, let's see, two of them are investors. So Nick and Tom Ferguson are both investors. Um, and then all of the rest um, are we uh part of our advisory team through austin technology incubator which we've been a part of for a few years okay and um and they're all great in their respective roles like some are sort of marketing experts some are product experts some are in, uh, pretty very large investors some are um fine like mike is a finance guy for example and we don't have like a finance person on our team so he helps a lot with that uh, Gaines Bagby is a <clears throat> sort of a big real estate guy, not in hotels, but still there are a lot of similarities he helps with. So yeah, the advisor team has been extremely helpful in a lot of ways over the years. You know, honestly, the, the most valuable thing that we found, um, comes from having an advisory team is just being, uh, having someone to, um, report to honestly like uh, especially before you have like a board of directors which we do have one but it's it's kind of like a practice one sure. um because you don't uh, from what i understand you you really have a board uh, that you have to answer to after series a but the one we have for seed is it's it's almost set up like a practice it's not really yeah, yeah. so having this board of advisors especially when you're early just having someone to report to, like to keep you honest, because like because if you don't have anyone to report to, then you kind of, I don't know. We found that you can, you know, it, it it helps us push ourselves a little bit when we know we have to meet with them at this month, and we we said we were going to do these things by this month, so we need to get them done or or have a good answer of why why we okay. did it. Two questions about advisors. You're introduced, but how does that happen how does the relationship occur do they you know are they introduced to you and say hey you should take them as your advisor someone comes to you i want to be your advisor do you get introduced and then ask them so what was the process and then if you can disclose no details are they incentivized in terms of advisory shares ownership how did you work that out yeah so um I think we probably have a unique situation with our advisors in which most of them, uh, so the, they're either investors uh, in which, yeah, of course they have equity through their investment um, or they're through uh, ATI, Austin Technology Incubator. And um, yeah, through ATI, it's like they have a network of advisors and we, we it's like, it's sort of like a matchmaking process. So like we can choose some and, then gotcha. they'll ask like, are, do you want to be on this advisory panel? And we meet like either monthly or quarterly. And um, um, they are incentivized. Uh, like we, we gave out some equity um, and, uh, or, or we will like, it's, it's basically promised and you know, we will on our next funding round or whatever, but um, sure. Yeah. And, and so, yeah. And, uh, but that's, that's sort of how we found. So it, it was really set up for us uh, in a lot of ways, um, yeah. Okay, great. Let's let's uh, meander just a little bit. 
you are one of the contributing authors to this. And I just had the author, Courtney Gross, uh, on, and we talked about this, the student's startup guide. And what she did is she went to all these students and say, hey, contribute a chapter and different things. Share, give a little preview. What is your chapter in this book? What's it about? What made you write it? Um, yeah, so I think, um, actually, I don't remember the exact topic of the chapter because it's been a while. Could you yeah. like tell well, me really quick? Well, start off with, what was the reason you wanted to contribute to this book? How about we start there? Sure. So, yeah, I mean, uh, Courtney was the, uh, I, I mentioned earlier that we had, we got this Blackstone partnership, right? Um, through this uh, Techstars Launchpad program. Courtney was the head of the Techstars part of that program. And so, uh, you know, I've known Courtney for years. Uh, she was, incredibly helpful throughout that program just like a great person great uh making connections uh helped us a lot in securing the the uh sort of deal with blackstone and uh so yeah i mean i love courtney and then after that we we kept in contact like she's on our quarter or our update email list and and uh she reached out for various things including, you know, she reached out uh, to me and, and a lot of the other uh, comp uh, startups that were in that Blackstone program um, to see if they wanted, uh, we wanted to write a chapter. And, you know, I've never written written a book or been in, in a book in any way before. So I thought it was really cool. And, and like I said, I love, I love helping or, try, you know, doing my best to, to share what I've learned. Um, through through the journey because I think like I think it's it's super important to like sort of uh, give back in that way which yeah. is basically the only way I can right now at least your chapter was about not going broke oh yeah okay <laughs> not going broke <laughs> well, while you're honestly, in college and as a founder yeah and I think we've talked about this a, a lot already but yeah. um really it's just like to reiterate it, it is really just about obsession i mean it's like you you have to um i, I remember now I, I i specifically mentioned the opportunity pipeline in that chapter that i wrote um which really is the number one what i mean for us at least it's just like oh i didn't i don't think i'd really describe the opportunity pipeline what it is so what it is is just any opportunity you have we have an excel doc and then we put the the like the link to the opportunity, the title, and the due date. Mm -hmm. And then we just have a doc, and it's like a living document. So we have like a uh, we have a a page that's for like upcoming applications, uh, and then we have like a pipeline, and then we have declined. And I think what's super important to do in whenever you're applying to anything, pitch competition, you know, investor application, um, accelerator application you've got to do pre-hustle. Pre-hustle is you got to reach out to someone there before okay. you apply. You can't just cold apply. It's like, it's also like applying for a job. You don't want to just apply for a job because your resume will just be another one in the stack. Like you need to like do the hustle, like call someone, uh, go in person, you know, contact someone somehow for any reason you, you make up a reason just, just to get your name on their mind. Like, and, and also to show that you're like, you're you're really you really want the opportunity you're willing to go out of your way be a little uncomfortable to show that you really want it um so that's something we always do always hmm. you have to do it and then another thing is um if you get a decline a lot of times they would just won't tell you why like in in life in general no one will because it's an uncomfortable conversation they don't want to have it they're just going to say no, like, sorry, we did, we had too many application um, applicants and you were close, but not quite. And then they won't tell you why. So we always, always ask, like, we will be, we will be very persistent until we get a, an answer, like a, uh, a, an explanation why we didn't get it, because that's the only way you can learn sure. and do better the next time. So we, both of those things, you know, again, we, we got declined a lot at first, but when you do both of those things over and over and over, <clears throat> you'll get better and, and you'll, you'll eventually start winning. 
uh, as long as you can get good feedback while you didn't. So, yeah, I think that having that um, opportunity pipeline was vital. And then also just like, I don't know, just being honest with yourself that um, it's probably going to take a lot longer than you expect sure. because it, it just does. And that's something that I didn't know or realize hmm. um, that it, it just, it just takes a long time, like longer than you, you think to do anything, including <clears throat> get to a point where you're, you know, you're no longer like eating ramen or whatever. <laughs> so. Courtney, I asked Courtney, what is the main pitfall that she would advise student founders to avoid. And her answer was, don't romanticize it. So personal question for you, how much did you romanticize it, if at all? And how much did that bubble have to get burst and the reality set in? What was that like for you? I love that question because that's another like super common thing nowadays. Um, I romanticized it a lot, honestly. <laughs> um let's see i watch shows like silicon valley um <laughs> there was one other one that i forget but yeah another show it's not like i thought that's exactly how it would be but kind of <laughs> i mean kind of honestly uh and and especially like coming from universities because in universities like they can't truly really teach entrepreneurship it's just impossible sure. um you have to do it but when 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 they try and and especially in the modern age when like entrepreneurs are in a lot of ways, idols like Mark Zuckerberg, Elon Musk, like they're just idols. Sure. And um, so people think like that's attainable or like realistic or like they, yeah, they, they, they see the end goal and not the, they see the, the ending and not the, um, the beginning and the beginning uh, for all, all those people were, was incredibly tough and, and just, um, and they see the show and it's like fun, but it's, um, and then in the university, they don't, I think one thing that's missing a lot of times from, from my opinion is just like how hard it's going to be in, in so many personal ways. It's just going to be really, really, really hard. And I don't know. I don't know if they should teach that in university. I, I don't know how they really would, yeah. but um, yeah, it's, it's something that I think is, so yeah, I was, it was very romanticized. There have been many wake up calls um, <laughs> to this day, like still just like the, you know, the valley of death between seed and series A is where we're at. And, you know, we didn't reach that valley of death point until years after starting the journey. And at that point, I would consider myself having learned tons of lessons, but, you know, I'm still learning this, like, it's, it's like, I did not expect it to be this hard, even, even here, even after raising seed, you know, cause like the goal for us was like, okay, we're going to raise a seed round we made it like we got it at that point and then it's like not even close like that that's when it really gets hard after that it's like in a totally different way yeah you know? <laughs> so uh, i love your transparency and I, I love i love that you shared very courageous of you because people could take that as a sign of weakness but um the fact that you're able to share so transparent and the lean times that you go, had to go through to stick it out to get to this point it's very admirable let me end this with some selfish questions for me. You join the startups.com community. You've been hanging out with the hardware, hardware founders, and it's been great having you. What's it been like for you at being part of the startups.com community? What's the benefit that you see? Like, what would you like to share? Yeah. So, I mean, I, <clears throat> I recommend startups.com, like the communities as much as, much as I can, uh, pretty much. Um, I, I really, I really enjoy it a lot. I mean, I think it's, it's super valuable. Um, the reason I started or I initially joined was because I wanted to, uh, have a group of people, uh, a, a group of peers, um, to talk to, um, uh, just not necessarily about like getting solutions to my problems, even just to share you know, just to have a conversation because being a founder can be extremely lonely. Um, especially like, even if you have co-founders, it doesn't make it any less lonely. I, well, may, okay. It, probably, it makes it less lonely, but you can still be very lonely because if you spend hours and hours every week, um, with the same people over years, it's almost like 
you're talking to yourself at some point, honestly, it's like, <laughs> there's just things that are hard to talk about, uh, with, with people, uh, like that. And so it's, I, I found myself like really wanting a, a group of founders and I, I, like, I didn't have that. Um, and so, yeah, it's been really, really nice. Uh, and that, and, and I feel totally, um, satisfied in that mm -hmm. sense. Like mm -hmm. it, it definitely does that hard. The hardware group is, is great. Um, lots of great people there, lots of great companies, but then, yeah. And then, but outside of just like satisfying, like that main reason I joined, I, I, I don't even know how many, I think it's been three months. Yeah. Since I joined and I've gotten tons of, uh, super valuable intros and, and, uh, meetings, uh, like advice, um, and just, yeah, I mean, it's, it's been great. It's, it, it's, it's shifted my mindset on, on a few important things. Um, and I think, yeah, I just, I would, I would highly recommend, um, uh, checking it out. Yeah. We're excited to have you and it's been great. We often sit around and talk, how do we find more Ian Howard's of the world? So thank you for, for that. I'm going to leave you the last word. We got other founders, you know, these other founders they are watching at some stage in terms of hardware. Most of our founders are at that pre-seed stage. They're just, they have an idea. They're trying to build something. What advice, what's the, what's the final advice? Or if they have to remember one thing from this and do it right after advice, that's going to haunt them with enduring value for the rest of their lives. I'm putting a lot of pressure on you, but from your heart, what, what advice would you give? What would be the last encouragement for them to take action on? Yeah. Uh, yeah. TLDR, if they only watch the end of the video, I think <laughs> the one thing <laughs> that, that should be done is, you know, I'm going to take a, a quote from, from Steve Blank again, like get out of the office, like get out of the building. Wow. Like talk to your customers period. If, if, if you haven't done it, just do it, do it. Even if you have done it, do it some more. It's never going to, it's never going to be a bad idea. Just talk to them before building too much because yeah, that that's, that's the most important thing. Like for any, for any stage really. Couldn't have said it better myself. I know some founders would want to contact you or talk to you. What's the best way to get a hold of you in our community or outside if they have questions how open are you to doing that? What's the invitation? Uh, yeah, and I'm open to yeah, happy to happy to answer questions or connect. Um, my LinkedIn is good, so Ian Lee Howard on LinkedIn, uh, or um, also email Ian Howard at showerstream.net. Okay, I'll um, include all this yeah. information in the description, and then if you're part of the startups.com community, I know you and I talk on Slack all the time, so just uh, send Ian a Slack message and join that hardware community. It's a great place and get connected with other founders. Ian, this has been a pleasure. I just, I chuckle again. I, I look forward to continuing to work with you. And even though sometimes I'm at a loss because you're so much smarter than me in these things in terms of your product and what have you, but just watching you go through the journey, it's been inspiring for me and I hope it inspires other people. And yeah, let's see what happens. Look forward to catching up again. Thanks so much, Ed. Thanks.